everybody. Welcome to Off Panel, a weekly interview podcast about all things comics brought to you by Sketch.com. I'm your host, David Harper, and this week's guest is the writer of comics like The Sacrificers, A Righteous Thirst for Vengeance, and Deadly Class, as well as a slew of upcoming releases at Giant Generator, his imprint at Image Comics. It's Rick Remender. Thanks for coming on, Rick. That was really smooth, David. I mean, I, I, given that you're also fighting some sort of a bug, I I, ex, I didn't expect it. You you went right into it, and it was it was uh, it was nice on my ears. It's the one time that I come across as a professional during my interviews, and it's the one time I really use my radio voice. And then the rest is just a a complete disaster. But it's fun. You really did it. You turned it on. Good radio voice. Congrats. Thank you. Well. You already spoiled the uh, the note that we both are fighting off something post New York Comic Con. But besides that, how was your New York Comic Con? I don't know about you, but the last five years for me since the weasel got into the Hadron Collider, <laughs> <laughs> I, I told you it's, we're, like, we're going to be professionals. We're going to do callbacks. We're going to set up. We already set the tone here. Yeah. The <laughs> since we've entered into this dark, strange universe. It's been really bad, and I lost my father, and a million other horrible things have happened in the last five years, and I haven't done any shows or set up a booth in probably seven years, 2016. You forget that it's important to talk to human beings, and one of the things that comic books gives us is that we are an intimate industry where we're allowed to see see the people who ingest what we create and have really intimate, wonderful moments with them at these conventions. And if you look at them solely as commerce or solely as, you know, a way to to seek validation, they can become pretty toxified. Um, But when you remember how important it is, if you're pouring your, your heart and blood into a comic book, how important it is to like see the human being who was, you know, reading it and reacting to it. I haven't done that in seven years. Uh, I've done a couple little things here and there. And this year I I did a few signings at the image booth at San Diego and I've done a few in-store signings and it gave me a taste of it. But four days at the booth talking to people who, you know, during the last five years, six years, seven years, while I haven't been doing conventions, I finished Black Science. I finished Deadly Class. I finished Seven to Eternity. I finished Low. I finished everything that I started 12 years ago, I wrapped up. And during that time of wrapping them up, it is equivalent to really killing yourself to try to tell the best story you can. And then crickets. I've been off of, off of Twitter for three, mostly four years, but entirely for three years. Um, So I don't, I don't seek out any sort of internet nonsense but the by not doing the shows you'd separate yourself from any reaction i have a lot of friends that are comedians if they nail it they've got a lot of people laughing and they got an energy in the room i've got a lot of friends who do a lot of different things and we talk about this we talk about we call it the 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 desert island do you do this you know without an audience and as a comic book creator who's not going to shows and not looking online what ends up happening is you do your very best, you finish something, um, you throw it into the hurricane of publications, and then you just kind of go, well, I hope somebody enjoyed it. Right. And this this was an experience where I got to hear just <laughs> such an amazing experience hearing, you know, a thousand people want to, whatever it was that was just so goddamn crowded, I couldn't even guess how many people I talked to want to have discussions about the ending of the books or the beginnings of the new books or, you know, my comedy book, The Scumbag, that sort of helped me get through the pandemic. And it refilled my my fuel tank pretty good. I, f- I came home and, and felt like, oh, I got to start doing that again. That was <laughs> That was a really wonderful thing to get to talk to everybody. So on Friday night at the con, I went out and I had dinner with Declan Shalvey and Stephen Mooney and some some other folks. Uh-huh. And we were at this Italian place and my wife and I are walking back to our hotel and I come around the corner and there's this massive crowd of people. It's you, Wes Craig, Stephen Green, a bunch of different artists, all I think coming out of dinner or something like that. And you head one way and then the crew heads the other way. And it was funny, though, because like you just had this smile on your face and you happened to walk the same direction as my wife and I. We were standing at like the the sidewalk waiting to go across. And I was like, I feel like I should mention the fact I'm about to do a podcast with this guy in seven days. But I was like, you have this smile on your face where you just had this amazing time with all these like people you probably haven't seen in years. Yeah. And 
I was like, I don't want to mess with that moment. But I imagine that's a big part of it, too. It's like a big part of Giant Generators Con is you announce these exclusive agreements with like 12 artists. A lot of people you've worked with in the past, a lot of people you know and are friends with and everything like that. I imagine that was a big part of the con, too, is is not just seeing fans and hearing their response to everything, but also getting to see your collaborators and getting to, like, go out with them and hang out and, you know, yeah. be proper friends again. Yeah, I mean... It's why it's why I love doing this. It's another reason why I love doing this is, you know, we're all sort of kindred in a lot of ways. We're all kind of different brands of the same freak. And <laughs> I think that I had, you know, I had really missed out on that and forgotten. And we would I would try to do phone calls and, and Zooms and keep up with everybody. But, you know, that getting to go out to dinner and and see everybody and laugh and make jokes and bust balls and have drinks and, and overeat. Yeah. I mean, you caught me in a moment. I remember that because they were all going to go to the bar and I had this thought that was like, tonight's been really great. What if I left right on time and went home and went to sleep? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of doing the thing where I, dr- I, I try to drain the fun a little more and I go to the bar and then we're out till two 30 and I end up being too tired I was like, what if I left now? And I was like, I'm I'm old enough to have a little maturity. I said, I, I, I could stand it out. And it was good. But yeah, I mean, you nailed it. It's it's camaraderie. It's friendship. And I think that it's that community that, you know, modern life has sort of taken away from so many of us. And we can replicate that in comics by hitting the cons. And I did it. You know, God, I did it for so long from 90 I started doing San Diego regularly promoting my work in 98. I went 97 with a little booth in 98. I had a bigger booth and I started doing shows five, six, seven shows a year, every all the time until my kids were born in 2009 and 10. And then I slowed down and I kept doing shows pretty regularly until 2015, 2016. But I don't think until New York this last week, I recognized just exactly all of the things that it was nurturing me with, you know, the, the hanging out with friends and and seeing the people that we work with, because it's an isolated, it's an isolated job. You know, like I have the giant generator offices in Pasadena and um, we've had rotating people rent offices here and come in and out right now. Um, Rick Spears and Jerry Duggan rent spaces downstairs. And when they're in, it's really nice to get to see them. But for the most part, this, this is a very, a, a very lonely job. And so, the con reminded me like, Hey, I should go do that more. Is it kind of wild to think about like when you were first like going to cons, you probably had just like the normal size table and everything like that. But this one, I imagine this is the first time where you really busted out the big guns for giant generator. Cause you had that big, big booth. that was like the same space as like kind of IDW's was where it, it wasn't as tall, but it gave you a lot of room for doing signings, a lot of room to put out all your books of which there are many. Is it kind of wild to think about going from those early days of your cons where you're getting things figured out to now where you take up a, I mean, what is that two, is that two tables worth or is that like four? Like, I don't even know how big it was. It was just giant. Well, I didn't know they were giving me that much. I just asked for an end cap enough for three tables. And then when we got there, there was a lot of extra room. And so we rented two extra tables and had five total, which it turned out we actually needed because of you know, 25 years worth of books. And I've made some really nice Jaclay prints. Um, some had some wonderful artists do some group shots of all of our various characters. And so we had a lot of cool stuff to put out. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I find any sort of sense of pride or, or accomplishment. I suffer from, I forgot what my therapist used to call it, but I fear that if I feel happy about a thing that I'm tempting fate to get rid of it or punish me, sure. which I'm guilty of when it comes to bragging about not getting COVID on Instagram Wednesday and waking up Friday sick. But in regards to at the moment, it was, oh, I don't know. I mean, it, yeah, there's a kid in me who's that was the dream, right? You know, I didn't need it. And it wasn't really like, you know, uh, I didn't expect Mike in New York to give me such a beautiful, huge space there. Um, I think uh, it ended up being financially, um, you know, have, I don't know, having all the books out and, and, and the amount of stock that we sent, it was, it was lucky because we actually ended up needing the space and we ended up selling almost every single book we brought. Whoa. 
and I brought, you know, we brought too much because I think that one of the main reasons I went is because I have such a negative filter and I'm so constantly, I have a, I, I, as a child of abuse, I have a very self-deprecating voice that's been built into my brain and he's always very unkind to me. And I always anticipate that the world will reflect that unkind voice. And I didn't, hadn't done a show in so long. And I think in like the dark dungeon part of the brain, there was probably a fear response of going and finding out that, that your career's over. Every artist and writer on some level, I've always felt, and I think a lot of us understand, we get an expiration date on our forehead. And you're always trying to look for like, Am I done? Should I get off the stage? Are people finished with me? Should I stop trying to do this? Um, and so I guess by not doing shows, obviously, the last couple of years, there was, you know, COVID and the pandemic couldn't do it. And then before that, I was show running and living in Vancouver and making deadly class. And I've been pretty busy. Um, but I think that the times that I've had opportunities to do them and skipped was because I didn't want to go and see that nobody show, which I mean, my books sell better than they ever have. And I, you would think that that would be, you know, a, a balm to my stupid brain um, that things are okay, but it, it, it's not. So I wanted to go do something. I wanted I wanted to get an end cap and, and set up to also celebrate with all of these, these people who I've worked so hard with to do the creator owned books the way I think they should be, which is like, a team stays together and works themselves to death, no matter what, hell or high water, and tells the story they set out to tell to the best of their abilities, which is the hardest thing in the world to do because of a million reasons I won't get into because I can digress really easily and then this thing will just be a um, scattered part of all the nonsense soup. But so I wanted to honor all of the collaborators and I wanted to have a big banner up and I wanted to be able to do group signings together and to celebrate. And it's a small celebration. It's not enough when you work, you know, all of the guys on all of those teams have worked between five and, and 10 years on, on, on the books and putting them together and spent a huge chunk of their lives and their faith and, and, you know, dumped into these projects. And so even just having a small little end cap table with a, a little space to get together and sign the books and the prints and to hang out together and have a laugh for a few hours and just to celebrate and give each other hugs and be like, Hey, congratulations. Because when all those books were wrapping up, none of us saw each other. And, um, and that's tough. It's tough as a human. So when we got there and Mike had given us the extra space and we rented a couple extra tables, it was nice. It was like, Oh, we have room to all sign and still leave the books out. And, um, it was a it was a good show. Uh, yeah, I mean, forget it. I'll just say it made me happy. <laughs> if it was fate, then then by God, you know, fate be tempted. I love it. It was a good con. It was a busy con, and it was. I mean, the one thing that's nice for you in particular, I imagine, is there was just so many of your collaborators there. Like I was, I took over Declan Shelby's table to sell a zine that I made, and I was right next to Wes and Drew Craig, and I don't know. I mean, it's just it's pretty amazing to like walk those aisles and just see how many of those people that you've worked with directly. But I did want to talk about, you know, your love of comics and how that started, because one of the things I read a lot of interviews with you and you've been pretty transparent throughout your life and your career that making comics wasn't a dream, but the dream, it wasn't just like a thing you wanted to do. It was kind of everything you wanted to do. I imagine the collaboration is part of this, but what was it that you loved about comics so much, even from the beginning? Like, was there something about the medium in your earliest days reading it and like even wanting to tell stories that hooked you in a major way? I mean, yeah, there's that. The, the You know, I, I have uh, my mom raised me just reading Greek mythology to me. And I think it I think it just planted all of these like crazy narratives in my brain that have been spinning out since formative years of my youth, I was just watching Star Trek reruns. You know, I'm of the generation that I'm four years old when Star Wars comes out. I watched it at a drive-in theater. I was the kid in Sears who bought the first line of toys. That stuff coupled with the Greek mythology my mom just read to me endlessly gave me a desire and a, and a 
passion for telling story that they just they and they just they just kind of cook up in my brain and I need to communicate. I need to, you know, find a way to get them out. And as a kid of the eighties, you know, comic books, punk rock and skateboarding sort of cooked me into the, the creature that I, that I am to this day. And I think that the comic books, at least the, the journey I took as a fan it starts as a kid who's listening to Ian McKay or reading interviews, and he's talking about kids getting together and 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 making their own art and DIY and self-producing it and putting it into the world and how Discord started and not doing it for money, but doing it for camaraderie and friendship and expression and art. And man, that excited me so much. And saying it again, repeating it, it's still it's still like a lightning rod of excitement. Like, yes, do that. No matter what, do that. And comic books is this place where you can make a movie on paper or a TV show or a cartoon or whatever, however you want to envision whatever it is your you know the other mediums are, and it also has its own its own its own cadence. It's got its own pacing. It's got its own craft behind it. But anything you want to do, if you wanted to make a TV show or a movie or a cartoon, I've done those things. Man, I'll tell you what, they're hard to get done. <laughs> they're hard. And when I was a young man, I thought they were just straight up impossible, especially the kinds of things that I wanted to do. So comic books is this beautiful medium that nobody can stop you. No matter what your idea, no matter what it is you want to make, no one can stop you from making it. And there are these brick and mortar shops now scattered across the country they outlived Virgin Records and Tower, and they they they're still out there. They're sometimes they're hungry and starving, and sometimes they're doing okay, but they're still out there in these brick and mortar shops that you know kids in the neighborhood can skateboard or ride their bikes to, and go in and they can buy comics. Teenagers, you know, holdouts from the millennial generation and Generation X, people who are aging and still just sticking with it because they love it. And there's something just crazy magic about that. I don't think we appreciate it enough, what we've got. And so I love that aspect of it. I love creator-owned comic books. I love teaming up with a brilliant artist and really working my craft and putting in the hours and the love necessary to generate something with, with the people that I work with to make something out of thin air and to give it and to make it good, hopefully. I mean, it is interesting to think about your career in the context of all of what you just said, because, you know, you worked for listeners that don't know, Rick worked in animation on movies like Anastasia and uh, the Iron Giant. And I read that in the past, you, you enjoyed that work, but it wasn't as fulfilling as comics. And I imagine a lot of it is like, you look at like what you and Wes did on Deadly Class, like you told that whole story, you made a show out of it, you came back, you finished the story. And then I mean, I think a really funny example of this is as that end was happening, Wes was also developing Kaya and like, this is like a dream story he always wanted to tell. And it totally kicks ass. It's an amazing book and Wes yeah. is just crushing it. Yeah. And like, that's the thing that's amazing is whether you want to make comics with a friend or if you want to tell stories yourself, you don't have to rely on a system and you also don't have to be part of a group of like hundreds or even thousands of other people to execute it. It can just be you and three other people just making magic happen together. And that's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. There's nothing else like it. And I'm a punk rock kid, so I don't care about the size of the stadium I play in. Sure. I would much rather play the small bar and play my own songs with my friends joyously and play the songs we want than to go into the stadium and parrot Aerosmith songs or whatever people want to hear. You know, like um, we own our songs, we write our songs, we create our songs, and we, you know, very, very grateful for every single human being who shows up to listen to them. And, and that's a fact. I just, you know, that's not, that's not lip service or I think that we can run the risk of, you know, trying to seem grateful to stave off more bad juju. <laughs> but I think that in, in, you know, in my, in, in my heart of hearts, I'm so grateful for every human being who takes the time, especially in a world addicted to screens where everybody stopped reading there are people out there who will still take the time to go to a store and buy a pamphlet that you put together and read it. Man, that's, that's magic. You know, I am interested in like 
you have a background in art. You did work as a penciler and as an inker. You've those are things that you've done. I mean, obviously, it's not something you're still doing, and obviously, you made the right choice leaning into writing. But do you feel like that part of your brain still is a major part of how you think about comics? Sure. I mean, I know how to I know how to lay out a page. I've been a storyboard artist. I've penciled thousands of pages. I've inked thousands of pages. Um, and I've animated, you know, spent six years as an animator, you know, mm-hmm. years as a storyboard artist. All of that feeds into the storytelling ability. And I think that I'm very fortunate in that I have that background because great artists trust me to give them great stories and know how to execute. Right. And I don't think that's ego. I think that I, I think I've earned that much. Um, and I think that that came from, you know, uh, I've busted my ass. I started making my own comic books in high school and in college. I went to the Joe Kubert school for a little while before, you know, realizing I could probably teach myself these things. I've dedicated, you know, I worked in a comic book shop for two, three years. I've just given my life over to this thing. And I've spent my life in a room by myself drawing and inking and writing and sketching and animating and storyboarding and doing every single one of these jobs and trying to get really good at them. And I think that that makes me a good collaborator as well, because I I know what can fit on a page. I know how to execute things. I know in my head how I would lay a page out. And if it can't be done, I know to take things out. I know not to do double action in a panel. I know how to pace pages. I know when, when to go heavy panel count and when to go light. And that all came from spending all of those years doing both. Now, I mean, the reason I knew how to do both is I had all these stories itching in my head. And the only way I could get them out was to also draw. I, I like drawing. I always did. I always did. But I like telling story more. But I realized if I was going to do comics, I had nobody, there was nobody going to draw my stories. I had to learn how to do all of it. And around 2007, I was trying to juggle all these various jobs and I was, you know, penciling one book and I was, uh, I was storyboarding uh, and writing a video game for electronic arts. And I was trying to write, you know, five books and I was doing blah, blah, blah. I was teaching at the same, I just had to make a choice. And um, I had electronic arts offered me a full-time position to run the storyboard department for the Simpsons games. They were going to do a bunch of Simpsons games Now, I'm a card-carrying Gen X kid, and in the 90s, The Simpsons was really important to me. Uh, Those first 10 seasons still are. I I love them. And so that was like, okay, I had to make a choice. Secure a job with all the bennies and sit around and storyboard and, and work in The Simpsons universe that I love, 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 or go back to my original commitment of creating my own shit. And creating my own shit is like, I'm broke. <laughs> it's it's there's tumbleweeds. Does anybody really care? And the ones the one light I had at the moment is that Fear Agent started to get an audience and people started to read it and they were nice. And then the people reading it, uh, some people reading it were at Electronic Arts and they brought me in to write the video game Dead Space. And so I said, "Well, I'm getting I'm getting writing work now." And people are liking this and they're, they're responding to it. Now at this point I've been writing and doing comics for a decade and no one gave a fuck anyway. Yeah. Not to drone on it, but yeah. So around that time I, I had to make the choice and I chose, I chose to move to Portland um, where a bunch of my friends had gone and it was a little bit cheaper than San Francisco and to lock in and, and, you know, chase the dreams a little bit longer, even though the last decade had been a lot of, you know, 12 hour days, seven days a week, working four jobs just to stay alive while I kept making comics that nobody cared about. And maybe they shouldn't have, I don't know. I had a lot of, they, I got, by the time I broke, I was seasoned and good, which may have been a real benefit, but that's the long winded version of why I, yeah, the, the, the road I took at least. And I still sketch and play around, but I realized that my brain really prefers structuring story and stuff. And, and that's where my heart's at. And now, a quick word from one of our sponsors. Do you wish that buying and reading digital comics was even easier? Well, I have good news. Omnibus is here for you. 
Omnibus is a modern digital comic book store and reader app carrying your favorite single issues, volumes, and omnibuses all day and date. They're paper book, just like your LCS, but digital, so you're already used to the experience. Their focus is on building an excellent customer shopping and reading experience and using novel discovery features to help fans find their next new favorite book. They feature top tier content and already have many of the top publishers and comics today on board. Want to find the right digital comic shop for you? Download Omnibus today on the Apple App Store to do just that. And now, back to the show. 2007, I mean, obviously that's a, a big fork in the road moment year for you, but it, it is kind of interesting personally because that was actually the year that I started reading your stuff. When the In League and Gigantic came out, like both of their covers, I don't know what it was. I think it was it was Matt Broom and Eric Nguyen, I think, uh, that, that did those two books respectively. And I saw those and I was, all right, I'm going to start reading these. And then I read it and I was like, I got to read Fear Agent. And I went back and I started reading Fear Agent. And it is kind of interesting to look at that time as like this, I feel like you had a few kind of fork in your road moments to a certain degree where, you know, either this is where you kind of started stepping up to the next level and then you start getting more attention and then kind of like there was a change in terms of how you per- were perceived and things like that. Do you feel like there are any books in particular that kind of stand out in that regard, like as moments where your career and as prospects really changed? A lot of those books are really big fun ideas that I learned a lot about because of the limitations, not of the comic book medium, but of what can be accomplished based on the will of your collaborators. You look at Deadly Class and without the will of Wes Craig to partner up and grind, and the book made money. Beyond the money though, it takes a spiritual love commitment to the project that is really hard to understand for anybody who hasn't drawn a page. And a lot of those books, I feel like, were really huge, wonderful learning experiences, teaching colleges, if you will, about that aspect of it. Because I was getting, I was putting together books as best I could at the time at an early stage in my career. Well, Early-ish, I mean, a decade decade (laughs) in. It was not an easy road. I don't know how I stuck through it those years. Um, I learned every every book, every imperfect book, every imperfect choice, every stumble, which I think I had probably, you know, more than most people because I was trying to blaze a trail of creating whole new world material, brand new things and make them last – And I think that that was a lot of the guys and gals in my generation of creators, you know, Robert's way was just like, these two things do not stop. And Invincible and Walking Dead would not stop. And I remember looking at him going like, I, I don't know how he does that. (laughs) That's crazy. Yeah. Like what's going on in his corner. But uh, in my corner, it was just trying to put things together, stitch them together. And then you would find that the artist would quit after the second issue. And now you're trying to stitch together a creator-owned book where an artist quits after 40 pages. And that's hard because they're hard enough to make people care about, but the artist quit. And anytime I would find an artist who was underappreciated or unknown and start working with them, Marvel would come and offer them work. And back then that was seen as like, oh, you got to go do that. So they'd quit. Or they would start having like their cousin come in and do the my book and not tell me. And I'd be like, these pages aren't great. <laughs> there were so many great lessons about creator-owned where I was like, okay, I like sharing ownership. And even if I'm giving them an idea and coming to them with an IP, artists have to complete five issues before they get vested in ownership. Because if an artist does five issues, I can end the arc and then start the next arc with a different artist. But I learned in those years if an artist quits or doesn't commit or, you know, starts doing other work when you're on a creator owned book issue two, three, man, that is a dead book. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> That'll kill the book faster than anything. So every hardship, every mistake, every job, every different road I took, all of it facilitated me creating the imprint uh, that I'm running at Image now in a way that I think will make it stand out and will curate and control the material. The artists and writers will. I don't control or own anything other than what I write. But anybody we bring in, we're taking nothing. I'm just helping. So J.G. Jones, his new beautiful book, Dust to Dust, I'm not taking any ownership or any participation or any stake. I'd help him develop it. 
I think it's a great project, but if he doesn't want me to, he doesn't have to. I'm just trying to do things in a way that that honors that punk rock kid so that I can go to bed at night and feel like, no, nope, I stuck with it. I, I I stayed true to the I stayed true, true north to the ideals. And I think all those different jobs and all those hardships and all those forks in the road, going back to those, all those lessons were really wonderful and and helping every mistake really ended up being uh, very helpful in, in formulating how to do it correctly, I think. That's the thing about, I mean, any creative medium, really anything you do in life, to be honest, is like everything you do is an opportunity to learn something new. And I'm sure you're going to pick that up on The Sacrificers. I'm sure you're going to pick it up on Grommets. I'm sure there's going to be things you pick up on all your books where there's something new. It's like, oh, okay, I can tweak my formula this way or I can do this this way. And all of a sudden it's a little bit, you know, something changes in a positive way. I th- I mean, I guess the only, like if you ever get to a point where you just kind of like turn off or you, you turn away from those learnings and you're just like, I know how to do it. I imagine that would be a problem because it's like, you know, as much as people say that like comics are exactly the same as it always has been, it's changed a lot and you got to adjust and you got to learn. And it seems like that's something that's re- you're really big into. Well, learning how to tell a story well, I was a desperately, um, I, I was desperate to be heard. The situation I grew up in left me unheard. I was unheard. And so writing for me earlier in my career was like a desperate desperate uh need to express myself and to talk and to get this stuff out and you know processing it and processing the desolation and despair through Heath Houston floating in space or processing being sort of you know um forced to deal with other you know the the moral authority of the right and and the religious right that I grew up around and their judgments of me and strange girl and finding something personal in those books and every book since finding some way to express that has been so important. But the joy of getting better is lately I've learned how to do that in less um, every, every year you get smoother. It's like, I've, I've heard it, you know, what, what writing is the opposite of athleticism and that they get worse and worse every year and we get better. <laughs> um, I've not heard that one. And it's true, though. I'm better now than I've ever been. I wrote something last week that I would just, in, I, in, I intuited how to do it without struggle. It, I, I knew, I, I rewrote it four or five times to like tweak. And, and I always do that to cut the dialogue. I try to cut every bit of dialogue down 50% and find cleaner, smoother ways of expressing whatever it is the characters are expressing. And all the various little crafty things, blah, blah, blah. That sounds masturbatory, um, but I think that, you know, you get better as you work and you get better and better and better and better and better. And it's, I don't know, I've read a lot about various um, careers and what they do to the human brain and what career paths you can expect. They uh, There's like 85% of careers at the age of 50 are pretty much going to decline and you're going to go down a hill until you end up, you know, dead. But writing was the number one in that like around 50 is when you're really is when you're really catching on. <laughs> and I like I liked reading it because I feel that way. Now, the artist's job is to write stories about it, observations of the world from outside of the world. So I try to keep that in mind. I try to keep I have a list of 100 rules. If your heart ain't in it, don't begin it. All these various things, personal want, need theme plot. I got a dry erase board full of a thousand things to remind me of what to do structurally. But um, I am now at 50 intuiting these things without having to refer to them and study as much, which is very nice. Um, And uh, each one of the books have taught me how to get there. It's funny. There was one comment I was going to make about the sacrificers later on that I was like, I don't know if you're totally going to understand what I'm saying. But after hearing that, I feel like you will. The interesting thing about the sacrifices, like I think this works off of what you were just saying, in that you're always improving all this stuff like that and how things are smoother. There's this thing about the sacrifices where it feels exactly like a Rick Remender book, but it also feels the least like a Rick Remender book versus like when I first started reading you. And yeah. do you get what I'm saying there? Yeah. 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 I'm glad. That's great. That's great. That's a great compliment, even though it's a little bit hard to think about all those years I worked so hard on those books. I think they hold up and they're still like an emotional core and great art. And they're, you know, like I still am very happy when people show up with a lot of that work, but I am really grateful that um, 
I can see that I think in my own work. And I guess I don't want that to sound self-aggrandizing because I hate ego and other people. And I don't want to be sitting here talking about me and like my craft and me, but I do feel good about that stuff. And I do feel like I've learned enough. And it really comes down to like the time I've spent in television as a showrunner and the time I've spent working with like the Russo brothers and Carrie Fukunaga on Tokyo ghost and, you know, Seth Rogen on fear agent. I've been in such big rooms with such amazing talent and getting to, you know, work on the Holy roller with Andy Samberg and figuring out how to, you know, make Andy laugh on a zoom. And all of these are really, really amazing people who I love so much getting to the point of craft where you've done work at that level and and you can you can sit in a room with people like that and bounce ideas and volley and build i think that all of it and i don't say that in like a a, a star fuckery way if you're working with you know great people and people who have achieved wonderful things in the arts that they've you know uh, uh, sought out you learn so much from them and as along with all of the doing, if the work, it, you know, and thank you for, you know, having read the books back then that, and, 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 and still, you know, reading them. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, and if you can see that there's growth and that the books still feel like my voice is there, even though I'm cutting the dialogue down 50% and trying to like, you know, get all crafty. And that's what I learned in TV a lot. I spent, you know, four or five years working in TV and, you know, Man, when you hear somebody read your lines, when you hear a great actor or actress, I mean, you can really get a, a quick sense of, oh my God, that's verbose. You know, <laughs> I mean, shut up already. Like, I really overwrote that. And I think it's helped. I think every one of those jobs have helped me come to the the place I'm at now with the books. You brought up riffing with people and like getting on Zooms and making Andy Samberg laugh and everything like that. I was reading about the Holy Roller and how it kind of just stemmed from you just riffing with uh, Joe Troman from Fall Out Boy and also uh, another co-writer on that book. It did make me wonder about, I don't want to ask you about where your ideas come from because that's a terrible question, but do you find that a lot of your stuff does come from just chatting with potential collaborators and building out like through conversation where one thing comes together and then next thing you know, you're just kind of riffing and then next thing you know, you got a little bit of something and then you just keep building and building from there? I mean, yeah. And, and and there's like it, every project kind of took took form in a different way. In some cases, it's something that I've cooked up that I then reach out and and say, hey, you'd be great for this. And in some cases, it's something that we cook up together, you know, whole cloth from from the beginning and a million permeations in between. But in terms of the holy roller, it was pre pandemic. Joe Troman was renting an office. He's working on a, on a couple of, of TV shows that he's working that he has to various spots and he needed an office space. Cause he was also going cuckoo crazy. And so he, he rented a space here at the giant generator spot in Pasadena. And one evening he came up and was just strumming the guitar and talking. And he was talking about being a kid um, in a, in an area that, that was fairly anti-Semitic and he would go bowling and, and, you know, gave him like throwing the bowling ball kind of helped him get the anger out and stuff. And, and he was talking about, you know, that should be a, a super he throws bowling balls. I'm like, uh, -huh. and Harper Jayton and I had actually done a thing in captain Dingleberry called the Holy rollers, which was about a bunch of right wing nuts who roll bowling ball bombs into, you know, abortion clinics and stuff they don't like. And this was a much better version of that. And, and uh, we started just like laugh. And then we just started laughing because I think part of the punk rock sensibility is to really, is to, you know, it's the Mr. Show of it all. It's making, it's making, um, it's making horrific things and atrocities ridiculous so that we can process and laugh at them. And here he is talking about all this, you know, ugly shit he went through as a kid and he's turned it into this ridiculous superhero idea. And we, we started breaking story and um, a producer friend of mine was in the office um, shortly thereafter, uh, John Silk and um, John was also renting an office here. And he heard Joe and I talking about the idea and he said, man, I'm working with Andy Samberg. Andy would love that. And I was like, this is just crazy, but I'm so, I'm so exhausted from isolation from the pandemic. I don't really co-write anymore, yeah. but now I'm going to have two. I'm going to work with Joe Troman, who I, I, I love, and he's a great writer and very funny, 
but like, we're going to bring in Andy. Like what? <laughs> I said, okay, let's have a zoom. And three hours later, you know, the three of us were just laughing and laughing and laughing and just talking about this, this story. And it was like both very kind of visual and cool and vigilante fun comics, which we all, you know, I love a little bit of that, but it also had like a sort of Mel Brooksian kind of satire sense of humor thing that we were all just cracking up at. So that's how that one took form. And that's unlike any other, I mean, I could go through each one of the properties. They've all taken form in different ways, but I do have a rule for me. Like when I'm generating and a lot of the time I'll spend, I'll try to dedicate a quiet time to thinking of new ideas and development. And I develop a hundred things and I pick one out of the hundred as I'm building. And it has to, they have to satisfy three criteria. It has to have something about the world that I want to say. Tokyo Ghost, for example, is about, you know, watching myself become a tech addict, you know, 10, 12 years ago and commenting on that. It has to have something personal I want to say. Uh, The personal in regards to that was, you know, my dad was an addict. My mom was a bit of a codependent. I don't think she's going to listen, but sorry, mom, there you're outed. Um, And the addict codependent relationship, I thought was really interesting to tie that in with a tech addict, which we're all headed towards being. And then it has to have a third. So it has to have a personal, it has to have a world, and it has to have a really exciting visual component. And in, in the visual component was a lot of talks with Sean Murphy, where he's like, you know, first it's like a samurai story, but how do we talk about this in a samurai story? And then, you know, endless phone calls and development. And then it takes on, you know, a bit of cyberpunk and a, a bit of, you know, Neuromancer. You start mixing cyberpunk stuff in with Blade Runner stuff. And then, you know, you, you mix that in with the sort of the samurai becomes the pure utopia away from the the tech addict and you know blah 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 and then, and then the book kind of takes form and then you realize that in the middle of that if you're going to write a story about a codependent you know th- there's a love story in there and so then I started developing the love story between the two and layer by layer the thing kind of takes shape and the visuals I always try to get the artist on the phone and talk out my ideas and send a lot of look decks and things and see what they want to do and and we build that way and I, it's so fun. It's the most fun. It's the most fun. Do you find that, I mean, this is just kind of my own headcanon for you, which is a dangerous thing to do, but it seems like you've always been very artist. You've had an artist lean. You don't kind of have a single style that you like to work with. Some people have like that type of look that they want to achieve, but it seems like if Sacrificers needs Max Fumara, who I want to just say, terribly underrated throughout the years. His Mignolaverse stuff is amazing, so I'm so glad you're working with him. Like Sean Murphy, way different. Greg Takini, way different. You keep going, Wes Craig, I mean, amazing storyteller, but way different stylistically than those three. The commonality is all of them are good storytellers, but each had a much different style. Do you feel like it's less about style for you and it's more about storytelling when you're trying to find partners for these books? I mean, that's a big part of it. And, And also maturity and storytelling and also just, you know, each one of those artists you listed are the best in the world. I mean, the, the, they what they do is disparate. They're not similar in their in their approaches, but what they do and how they execute it is they are the top of their games. I mean, when I first saw Wes, I was like, well, there's a guy who's like Darwin Cook meets Toth, but he's also got this sort of like quirky fun thing, a little little bit of Kirby energy in some of it. I, you know, Tokini is like, I don't even think that comics understand what they have in Tokini. Right. Like you said about Max Fumera, these guys are high end, super art, art masters who are making comics that I remember when Tokini did an arc of Uncanny X Force, a bunch of people showed up at a con. They're like, we hate it. And I was like, oh man, it's just so beyond you. You don't even know what you're looking at. <laughs> and I did say that sometimes things that you think come out of your mouth, it turns out, um, People would prefer that it doesn't, but I can't sometimes stop them. Uh, they didn't know what they were looking at. Tokini is such a goddamn high level genius. And you can, you know, as an artist, you see what he's doing in there. And it's just, um, it makes writing stories for him just such a, any of them, just a, such a, 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 a joy. But yeah, I mean, while they may not have a sim- sim- similar sensibility, I'd say that they're, what their sensibilities are is the total uniqueness of their their artistic voices mixed with amazing storytelling skills. Um, And on top of that, it's coupled with, you know, exciting art styles that I just, you know, I love all of them so much. 
I do think the interesting thing is, is like with Takini, it's like, I bet you didn't get that complaint on low. Like you didn't have people being like, what's this guy doing here? Cause he defined the whole thing. But right. then yeah. when you're working on something like uncanny X-Force, where you don't really have control as to who's drawing what you have like Esad Ribich doing some of it. And you have Jerome Opeña doing some of it. I had control over all of that. That, oh, was did the you? One, that was the one book I did have control over. Yes. That was when I was still in the corner when I could do things my way before it started to, I get pulled into the spotlight a little bit. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, so you did have control, though, but it, because, like, I guess readers probably have some certain expectation as to, like, what something should be because yes. they've been reading superhero comics for forever. You're not just fighting against what's right for the story. You're fighting against the expectation of readers yeah. who read this type of story. Totally. And I, and and look, I mean, you know, the, I, I, it was interesting watching after a certain point, you know, Jerome hopped off and Esad Ribic came in for an arc and then, you know, I was doing shows and people would be like, what's that? And I'm like, it's Esad Ribic, you yeah. fool. Like, <laughs> what is the matter? What is what is happening? Oh my God. You know? And then it, you, you, <laughs> you and I recognize that, oh, well, these flavors are all delicious, but they're just not all for everybody. Yeah. And not every flavor is for everybody. And and that's okay. And and as you get older, you more accept that, you know, that like just because I know Greg Tokini is a top level genius doesn't mean everybody has to, but it's also Mainstream comic fans don't want fine art or things that seem disruptive in terms of stylistic approach. And whatever it was, there was just some people who wanted to crap on Greg. It might just be that they were really used to Jerome as the look or whatever. And, you know, then once Greg was gone and it was Phil Noto, and people would be like, what happened to Greg? And you're like, <laughs> <"Ugh."> <laughs> And now, a quick word from one of our sponsors. October is here and things are cooling off for fall, but not over on Zoop where this month is going to be hot. There are too many campaigns to name, but there will be launches from the legendary Howard Shaken, Second Coming's Richard Pace, the team behind the comic Canto, Green Lantern's V. Ken Marion, and the creator of the TV show The Goldbergs, Adam F. Goldberg. And that's just scratching the surface for October with so much more on the way. Head over to zoop.gg to support the live campaigns and sign for the ones coming soon. It takes less than 30 seconds to create an account, and the e-commerce style checkout is easy and intuitive. Add multiple rewards and add-ons into your cart, provide some info during checkout, and you're done. No confusing additional steps in finalizing your pledge, and no post-campaign surveys. And of course, every creator appreciates your support. For creators looking to crowdfund your project, Zoop is currently open for submissions. Email them at hello at wearezoop.com to start a campaign. And now, back to the show. This whole conversation actually started because I emailed Kat Salazar from Image after the news of your exclusive with Image came out. And I do think that that is kind of interesting because like, like you were saying with Uncanny X-Force, you did have control before you're in the spotlight. Now you have the spotlight and you have the control. And the, the thing that, that I think is interesting about it is I don't imagine that this situation is materially different from the status quo before the exclusive, because you've been at Image for a while. You've been pretty much effectively like exclusive to them in terms of actual production, what you've been putting out there. And you've been putting out a lot of work through them already. What made this deal something you wanted to sign? Like, was it more about the message and how it focuses things and says, this is where I am and this is what I want to do? Or is there something more to it? Oh, I mean, there's quite a bit. One, the business end of things, you know, um, Eric Stevenson was the first person to believe in me in comics. And um, he and Robert Kirkman, uh, well, frankly, coming up with Robert and Robert knowing Eric, it was probably Robert. Um, but Robert and Eric together, you know, sort of s steering that ship and the relationship we have going back, you know, 20 some years now. Good Lord. Um, <laughs> uh, old. But the um, the relationship means a lot to me. Relationship means most to me in all of these things. Life is so short and you want to work with people you like and, and you get along with and you see eye to eye with and you want to work with friends. And so there's that part of it. There's the part where they've supported me and they're the reason that I have a house. They're the reason that when things went really, really hardcore bad for me at Marvel and I was just miserable, they're the reason that there was like a road. And they could go, hey, we were still over this road. And I was like, oh, my God, can I come home? And they're like, yeah, come on back. And I was like, oh, thank you. And they fed me like a little baby bird. And I'll never forget that. I'll never lose that gratitude. And, um, you know, it's not that I'm not gracious or appreciative of, you know, 
being offered the Batman book or being offered the X-Men line or these really high profile Marvel and DC things. And I don't mean to shit on them ever for coming to me to offer me that. And I think that sometimes that can be the sort of how things are framed outside of my control. Yeah. I had a really bad time there, but it's like, you can't be mad at a place you don't belong for you not belonging there. You know, Um, I'm not that kid. I'm not supposed to be there and they're not supposed to, you know, listen to somebody who has opinions that are so divergent from their own. It it was not a fit for me. So I I hold no grudges or ill will, but I would never go back for anything. And I I tried to burn the bridge a few years ago. Things started to go a little sideways in, in, in career stuff and money. And I told my wife, you know, I was getting offers to go back and I was sitting around thinking about it. And it was such a PTSD moment for me because it was such an unpleasant time in my life that I just went online and started going, throwing bombs. Like, please don't offer me any more work. (laughs) Don't make me consider this. And so that, you know, catching up to today and your question, there's a lot of emotional baggage with how much I don't fit in with the mainstream crowd from the sort of the way that creators have been treated in the past to the exploitation of, you know, the art form to the way that to the credit to to how people are credited for these things. I could really go in deep. I'm trying not to, I have a lot of issues with a lot of the way that business is run. And I don't want to go back for any reason. I don't think it's good for, for creators. I don't think it's good for the industry or human soul to pour yourself in, into the form of, of a corporate IP character and, and pour your love and heart into those kinds of characters. I am still very aware that working on that stuff elevated my name and helped me at a point in time when I was destitute and creator owned comic books did not make money. And I was really struggling. So I'm appreciative of it and understand why other people do it. So get, get all the nuance of that, right? <laughs> because it is, nobody likes nuance, but it's very nuanced. Um, there's a lot of conversations about how people with audiences need to go back to them. And I'm sorry, but I'm not going to sit around crying any any tears for Disney or Warner Brothers if their comics aren't selling right now because of creative decisions being made there. I'm not going to cry any tears. Retailers can focus their energies on Evergreen, creator-owned books, Saga, Walking. We have shown this enough times to a lesser extent, a lot of like myself and Brubaker and Matt and Kelly Sue and Kieran Gillen and all of the people who have done this long enough to build an audience, making creator-owned books and pour their ass into them. There are ways through this without saying that we all have to go back and take one for the team and write a story about the Super Punch brothers or something that then could be turned into a billion dollar movie that, you know, eh, maybe we'll get a super thanks. Hey, thanks, little pal. Credit five hours into the credit sequence. This turned a lot more negative than I intended to let it. (laughs) That's okay. I mean, it's, it's all part of the path, right? It's just like. This is why you want to stay there. It's because image lets you do what you want to do and also gives you the ability to own your own work after you do it. I mean, I think that's one of the things that's interesting about Giant Generator is like, it kind of seems like you building a space that's what you always wanted for yourself and now you can share it with other people. Yeah, that that's that's right. And, and people who are like, hardworking and talented and nice and, and just want to make great work and, and, you know, show up and do, do it right. You know Um, I just look, I don't know. I came back from New York and I saw all these giant monolithic weird things of people signing lines of books and charging for signatures. If you're Gene Colon and you're doing a con and you're signing for a signature, you know, God bless. But there's people there who five years ago would have killed to have an audience. And now they're charging for creator owned signatures. And I'm just like, ah, there's so many parts of it. They're like, look, I, I could go on a tirade yeah. and lecture. I'm not gonna, but I just go like, Hey, you know what? Instead of, instead of, you know, being grossed out or wagging my finger or being an elitist or talking down or talking shit, just do it the way that I think it should be done. And, you know, image comic books have given me not just the sort of foundation and ability to do that, but the ability to guarantee 
with the books that we've been developing and, you know, a way to offer financial stability and security and ownership to all of these really great collaborators that I have. And, and, you know, the handful of people that I'm helping make their own material Um, and better to do it the way to walk the walk and do it the way you think than to sit around wagging your finger and talking shit at another one of these companies that pop up every six hours and go, we're the future creator owned comics. (laughs) Only creator owned comics means we own a good bit of it. You know, and you're like, wait, you're creator owned comics. We sure are, except we own a lot of what the creator creates. <laughs> oh, but they're part of our company, which has no valuation really until something. And you're like, but are they making your company? Like, don't look too close over here, son. And I'm just like, ah, gross. It's all so gross. So I'm in my corner. I don't care. I'll just make comics with people I love who I, and I respect and do good work. And hopefully people keep buying them. But um, I don't want to participate in what's going on. So the three-year exclusive is me saying nobody has built a better creator-owned infrastructure than Image. Uh, Nobody. And I've been everywhere and I've seen every deal. Image is the best by far. And they've nurtured me and fed me. Uh, They believed in me when no one else did. They fed me when I was naked and cold. And uh, I'm excited to make sure that, you know, my flag is planted there along with this imprint that we're building and see what happens. I don't know. Maybe it all go. Maybe it all fails, and everyone gets to listen to this in ten years and go, oh, "Listen to that guy. He's a real blowhard." I do think it's interesting to think about like this new wave of giant generator. I guess like kind of the second wave. If the first one was in twenty seventeen, like this is kind of hitting a new phase. The book that was really interesting to me. You already mentioned it, Dust to Dust, which JG Jones is co writing, drawing with uh, Phil Bram, also co writing. And I think that's interesting because it's before Giant Generator was all books you wrote. And now you have others that are looking to tell their own stories in there. And it's kind of interesting to see that and then also see like the the ghost machine thing that Jeff Johns and Brad Meltzer and everybody else are doing over there and yeah. seeing like how it kind of feels like we're entering almost to a new phase of like creator owned where all these different imprints are popping up, all these different groups or creators are grouping up and collaborating in a different way to tell their own stories, much of it happening through image. It seems like creators are finding new answers and kind of evolving what the idea could be of like how you do this sort of thing. Is is that kind of what giant generator is to use? Just like setting up your own sand, not your own sandbox, but like your own space for people to come in and to execute their ideas and be part of a like, kind of this imprint within the larger whole of image that just operates in the same way? The dream for me was a company that nurtures creators, but has a feeling of sort of Sopranos, Deadwood era HBO. Oh, nice. Um, Where we're not like, look, I, I think I saw everything that Jeff Johns was announcing and I was like, oh, man, I love it. I think it sounds so cool. It's the kind of superhero thing that could really get me to read it. And I think it looks great. And it's all these great artists. And it's a shared universe. And it gets my, it gets the kid in me all tingly. And what they're doing is, is it's like one of the few things I've seen with superheroes and that kind of stuff where like, oh, it's so interesting looking, right? It's so cool looking that I hope, I hope that they stick to it and build it and keep fleshing it out because I want that world to keep going. What I'm doing is so different in that it's not a shared universe. I've had I've had sort of moments of wanting to say like, what if what if uh, uh, Grant McKay was using the pillar and he jumped and he ran into a uh, uh, lead and dead Debbie from a uh, Tokyo Ghost and they had an adventure and I'm like, ah, it doesn't. It's 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 for my stuff. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the idea. Like you wouldn't see Tony Soprano fall into a like you know <laughs> the, the Hadron Collider and fight the weasel. And then end up in another dimension where he's like, you know, all of a sudden in the six feet under universe, that's like, that's campy and fun. It's, 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 I want to tell good, clean stories with a beginning, middle and an end Mm -hmm. that, that are, that are reminiscent of sort of that era of HBO. Sometimes it would be a season sometimes, you know, or the BBC back then, you know, Uh, and, and look, that's a high, it's a high bar, but that's the one I'm aiming for. Um, Where these, these artists, writers, collaborators come in and we make things for the sake of making pure things that that it's not a shared universe. These things are individual. These are stories. What 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 Phil Bram and JG Jones are doing with Dust to Dust is 
in the vein of, you know, no country for old men, but it meets road to perdition. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's one of those things that like, yeah, it's a great comic. And Oh my God, JG Jones is painting every single page sepia. And it looks like a beautiful movie from 1952 that was never made. It's so goddamn gorgeous. Looks like Ford directed it. It's just so great. But at the heart of it is a big fun idea. You know, when he told me about it, he's like, oh, yeah, it's a it's a small town in Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl. And some families are trying to escape, but there's a serial killer using that as an opportunity to hunt them. And I was like, oh, my God, I, what? I was like, I, I wish to, I'm like, I'm going to steal it. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I'm going to kill your I'm going to kill you both. You wish you never told me. But that's the kind of ideas that I want. That's the kind of books I want. I, you know, um, I'm working with Mike Hawthorne right now and Mike will be writing and drawing. And Mike and I came up together, uh, you know, 23 years ago, Mike and I were sitting around talking about, you know, how he was a cartoonist and he wanted to write and draw. And he had these stories of his family and troubles and things and wants to wrap it up. And, in, 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 you know, this, this, anyway, I don't want to pitch his book because we haven't announced it yet, but the excitement that comes from doing that, the excitement that comes from taking that creative energy and taking thin air and creating a story that has a purity of intention. It's a beginning, it's a middle, and it's an end. It's a good story. It's a clean story. It's told well, and that's it. Like what John's is doing and what those guys are doing with Meltzer, God, I think it looks super cool. And there's a part of me that goes, oh, I wish I did a big old thing like that with all the connective universe stuff. But it's a different species. It's a different species. I love seeing it. I'm really trying to aim for things that like, look, you don't need to have read anything to read, you know, low uh, or death or, glory. you know, like if you don't know what death or glory is, Hey, here's a book. You can read it. It has a beginning and a middle and an end. It's a story about me processing the death of my father. There's a personal component. It's also a lot like smoking the bandit meets convoy. So there's a w- cool sort of, you know, Sam Peckinpah sepia 1970s road story and you can enjoy it or not enjoy it. I don't know, but you know, all of the books are self-contained and that's sort of, uh, there's something beautiful about that, I think. I think the interesting thing about everything you're saying, like, I love the HBO angle, like that whole idea. And because on one hand, it's like, yeah, you're not saying that you're going to make The Sopranos or something like that. But you're, you're making a statement about the type of stories you want to tell, whether it's like a ongoing or if it's like a mini series or if it's maxi series or whatever. And it's interesting to think about that through like the conversations I have, like with, with my nephew, for example. My nephew loves comics. But he normally only really wants things that are complete. Like he wants to get something that he can get yeah. that has a beginning and a middle and end. Yep. And trying to pitch him on something that's just like, oh, you should read this. And he's like, well, is it done? And like, how many volumes is it? And blah, blah, blah. That's tough to do. But if you have people coming in with like creating with intention and creating with the idea that they're going to make something that has evergreen that yeah that, yeah i mean you made that instagram post a little while back about like how the importance is creating longevity and like those evergreen stories i you know i don't think comics could ever have too many of those because those are the exact type of thing that isn't going to be popular for a fleeting moment it's going to be popular down the line like people will re- be reading deadly class for like decades i mean you know in theory uh, when one would hope i people are still reading love and rockets Right. Uh, exactly. You know, I know they're still making that one, uh, you know, but I mean, in terms of these kinds of things, you know, look at what lasts, go look at what lasts, go look at what, go look at your bookshelf and what lasts and matters. You know, yeah, there's like stuff from the eighties that was in like the middle of a daredevil run that was like born again or Batman year one, but we all were following like Mazzucchelli and Frank around at that point or whatever. But most of it, you know, you look at what really made impacts and what really lasted anyway. I could go down that. I, that would be, a, I think that that's correct. And I, and I don't know if I'm right. I think that like time will tell, like if the, you know, the Jeff Johns version of doing this may be like way more appealing to a whale, wa- larger audience. And it's really appealing to me. I love it. Um, but I really feel that for me, this sort of quote unquote HBO version of it, where these, there's an integrity of the world and we're developing it. And, you know, I'm developing each one of these projects that I'm writing as I develop, you know, I've sold four or five TV shows and written a couple movies and that world forces a hard line. Like you have to work yourself to death for years to develop the Daniel Acuna book. You know, that thing has been developed. Like I've worked myself to death on that. And it, you know, it's, it's a, I can't talk about it yet, but there's, (laughs) 
there's a number of these things that like, you know, sacrificers I'd been working on for four years before Max and I even got to work on it. And then Max and I spent a year doing design work and world building and, you know, rewriting outlines. And, you know, I think that we're holding ourselves to that same, we're holding ourselves to that same standard. And I, I, you know, would never dare to compare myself to those things in terms of quality um, out loud. But I do think that what we're creating, if, if, if I were to crack open the truth of my ego um, is high caliber in, in regards to the, you know, a comic book version of that. I feel like there's probably space for kind of both flavors to succeed. And it's just, it's interesting too. It's kind of like the artists we were talking about earlier, where some people are Takini people, some people are Fermera people, some people are Jerome Opeña people. Some people like me are all three at the same time, but it's like, you know, with like Ghost Machine and Giant Generator and all that, it's like you're offering different flavors. You're offering different types of like stories that you could be enjoying. But I actually had a patron question from uh, Kenny Myers. He was curious about your level of involvement in the books that you're not doing, like the, the like the Dust to Dust and like the Mike Hawthorne one you're talking about. Are you more hands off or do you have input because it's your imprint? Um, it, it's sort of like what they want. I trust their ideas. I like their ideas. I like them as creatives. I'm helping like JG turns to me with questions about business or questions about like I helped he he bounced the covers off of me and we sort of workshopped, you know, the the logo and workshop the way the cover looks. And I'm good at that stuff. I've done a, a metric ton of it. And so, you know, with Mike, we're right now, you know, we're working in the development stage and, and his character stuff. And I'm reading that and we'll get on the phone and and talk. They don't have to take my ideas. I'm not um I'm I'm not an authority figure. I have no power over them. I have no, I have no anything. I I am in a position that what I learned and I have learned it time and time again, be it video games, animation, show running, live action, show running, animation, all the various jobs I've done. It's just that old adage, hire the right people and then, and then let them do their fucking jobs. Like let them just let them go. And in terms of these people, I have a skill set I can help with, um, you know, talking to three or four other like amazing, huge talents right now about what they would like to do. And if we can do something at Giant Generator and I'm, I'm available as an asset or I can just step back and, and help fan the flames. Well, it actually it reminds me of something. This was a long time ago and I've quoted it many times. So hopefully I'm doing it justice. But it was I had a conversation with Eric Stevenson from Image about how basically it's like people ask for like what he's looking for. He's like, I couldn't have asked for Chu. I couldn't have asked for like Saga. Like, how do you ask for that? Like, it has to be what speaks to them. And like, that seems like that's kind of what you're looking for. It's like, as you're kind of building this next wave of books at Giant Generator, it's less about like what you're looking for. It's like, I need to reverse engineer this genre so I can make it a hit. It's more about like, what do you want to do, Mike Hawthorne? What do you want to do, J.G. Jones? How do we make the best version of your book? Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm here as an asset as somebody who's, you know, spent 20 years developing, you know, film, TV, animation, video games, and, and has a good, good mind for it. And, um, you know, I think the books will be great. We're, we're not going to put out anything that we don't feel is great. And, you know, looking at the line, the way it's shaped up right now, um, it's not like anything else in comics. It's a lot of really unique and strange flavors. Um, I'm really proud of all of it. And I don't, you know, the one thing I can be sure of is nobody's showing up with anything less than their A game on, on, on any of these. Well, not to put any pressure on you, but I did have a patron question that was, it was from this Jonathan Kent Uritam, and he basically, he said he loved a righteous thirst for vengeance, and anything you can do to make something stylistically similar, tonally similar, something in the same universe, a sequel, whatever, apparently he is very desperate for a sequel, so <laughs> you, ha- you, ha- you have fans in that regard. That's the interesting thing, too, though, is, is like, I imagine a lot of times when it comes to your books... I mean, it's like the Eric Stevenson comment. You couldn't have went in thinking that you're going to make X or Y. Like maybe Sacrificers, you thought you had this idea, then it turns into something else. A lot of times it's like maybe you go in and you're like, I'm going to work with Andre again, like on, a, uh, like on A Righteous Thirst for Vengeance. And you go in thinking you're going to do something totally similar and then it becomes something completely different because that's just how it works. Yeah, I mean, you have to let it and, you know, you go in and you have, you know, a, a list of criteria. You, you know, you, you know, you a genre. You got a basic story idea. You got some characters. 
And then you break your characters down. They have a want and they have a need. Your want is your plot. Your need is your theme. You start breaking it down like we discussed a little bit earlier and you get into all the nitty gritty. But once you're telling the story and, and, and Andre is obviously one of the exclusive guys that is doing something right. of some kind. Which we'll find out at a later date. Then the future, the stupid future, if the weasel allows us to have it. <laughs> But you do, like, what I found with Righteous Thirst as I was doing it is it wanted to be very quiet. It wanted me to find a way to show everything and not tell. Now, that's a rule that I like, but I don't always adhere to. Sometimes I think I really enjoy writing, you know, intricate dialogue. And I'm a big fan of Richard Linkletter and, and you know, things that live in dialogue land. But Righteous Thirst was like, an exercise in how much it was a good, clean story told well. That was like what I put on the top of that document. It was a, a, B, and C, and D, and you get to, you know, by the time you get to Z, it's, it's you know, it's it's a very clean story. You may, I hope, hopefully you're not you know, predicting where it lands, but um, it didn't need, it wasn't a chatty story. It didn't need a lot of chattiness. It needed me to figure out how to tell it visually. And fortunately with Andre and Chris, I was very lucky to have an, an art team that could do that in a really beautifully cinematic fashion. So Andre and Chris are doing more work uh, at the company. Um, and that's all I can say. I have to admit, now you just have me wanting and everybody wants some like comic. I, n not that it, all the Richard Linklater heads are out there like thinking that that's the number one thing to go after. I just love that movie. Yeah. Richard, Link Richard Linklater. It's such a nice. weird snapshot of such a specific type of, of group of people. Yeah, College Texas baseball players. Just the thing that everyone is looking for. Apparently, it's exactly <laughs> what I was looking for. In, in Yeah, in the late 70s, early 80s, right? Exactly. It's dazed and confused, except for everybody plays baseball. But anyways, last question I have for you. I, I want to kind of tie all this together because, you know, as we talked about, you've always been a comics guy at heart and in what you do. And a lot of people are feeling uncertainty these days and maybe get, getting a bit risk averse in terms yeah. of how they approach things. You are, I would say, I, I would think it's fair to say you're going the opposite way and betting big on comics right now. Yeah. What makes that the right move for you? No one can stop me. <laughs> I mean, that's why you signed the exclusive, right? No one can stop me. You can't stop me, David. You dare? You dare try? I'm going to try, but you won't expect it. It's going to come out of nowhere. Oh, I'm no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I mean, it goes back to that core idea. Like, look, I'm, you know, I've been working on, I'm working on a movie and, and three TV shows. And I've been working on this movie and these three TV shows for like five years. And development is so hard. And schedules and strike after strike and then you know it's just i'm so not in control of any of it i can do good work give me a show i can make a good show give me a movie i'll make a good movie but i can't control any i can't control getting there um you know so you know even with like a carrie fukunaga on tokyo ghost you know that process takes forever even when you've got a you know a million pound gorilla director next to you it still takes a long time, but comic books is this place. I'll work on my, my pilots. I'll work on my, on my screenplays. I'll work on my pitches. I'll work on my film and television. And, you know, Pat Oswalt had a descriptor for it once, which I steal. And it was film and television. You sit at the computer for like 60, 80 days. You type, 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 type. You get fatter. Your back is hunched. You got Cheeto dust all over. You, you're, you're telling your family and friends like, I gotta, I gotta rewrite the second act. You just get in it and you're just writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. And you finally get it done. And he said, then you take it and you roll it into a tube. And you put it in a bazooka and you shoot it to the top of your bookshelf where it'll never come back. <laughs> yeah. Because so many times that's what happens. You know, like, uh, so many times that's what happens and um comic books it doesn't comic books when i know as the you know when when i know that script is good and you know my new line editor harper jayton and i have been working together for 25 years um when i when harper's like yeah 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 when i know that it's good and i get a little validation uh from 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 harper uh, and then I go to the artist and I go, all right, here's the pitch. And they go, oh my God, I love it. But you know, what if, what if the, this was a, this, and you're going, that's great too. And everybody's involved and it's a, you know, it's a big collaboration of love and fun. I can make the book. Nobody can stop me. The artist can draw it. We can get it colored. I can put words on it. Russ Wooten can letter it beautifully. 
we can we can send it off to Eric and, and all of my friends and Erica can go in and design it and put it together and it can go to the world. I don't know. What's better than that? Like, what's better? Sacrificers won. We sold almost 50,000 copies, right? Um, okay. Where else am I going to tell a story about a fantasy world? I don't want to spoil it. Well, people get sacrificed. I think you get that from the con. Yes. <laughs> but as we were developing it in this fantasy world and these gods and all this big, crazy sort of Mobius meets, you know, Tolkien, Kirby nuttiness, little Grant Morrison, little Neil Gaiman. It's all this stuff kind of like, you know, all these things w- that we love that have fantasy tinges kind of mashed together um, on the ground. There was this kid that I called Pigeon. And in my mind, Pigeon's just a dirty human. He's just a dirty human farm boy. And then Max comes back with these designs. He goes, Pigeon should be a pigeon. And I was like, God damn, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all. That's it. I love it. He loves it. We love it. And we're happy. Big smiles on our faces. And we make it. It's it's 50,000 copies of a book starring a little blue dirty pigeon boy and a and a fiery god lady. Like, what? Come on. Nowhere else can I do it. Nowhere else can anybody do it. And people love it. And then you go, and then you wait, and you're like, people are going to hate it. They're going to hate it. They're going to tell us we're idiots. And then people go, no, we love it. Thank you for entertaining us. And you go, oh, my God, life is good. It, it's, it's unlike anything. You can't get it anywhere else. Comics. I love it. Yeah. I mean, that is the magic of comics. And sounds like you're going to be doing a lot more of it when we find out what everything else is coming. We don't know right now because you're a man of secrets. But Rick, that is all I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about Giant Generator, the sacrificers and everything else. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, It's great talking with you, David. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel with writer Rick Remender. You can find his work in The Sacrificers at Image Comics, as well as a whole lot more in his work at Giant Generator. Love Off Panel and want to support it? Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts today and give the show a rating and review while you're at it, but five stars only. You can also support the show by backing it on Patreon. Find the show at patreon.com slash off panel. And when you back it on there, you get early access to each week's podcast as well as weekly content and more. Want even more? Subscribe to my subscription comic site Sketched at sketch.com for long-form articles, interviews, and the rest of the site's content. You can find Off Panel and Sketched on social media by following on Twitter and Instagram at, at SketchComic or following me at, at Slice Fried Gold. Big thanks to all my existing patrons, including Jeremy Thomas Burke, Jared Schwab, Scott Dunn, Chip Mosher, Alan Ellsworth, Seth Pomeroy, James McEwen, Kitty Myers, Andrew Lehman, Christina Merkler, Mike Cancel, Scott Place, Darcy Van Polgies, Travis Schmeiser, Tom Evans, Nally Mockery, Reed Beeman, Kelly Sudakonic, Max Wood, Jeremy Lambert, Brian Hole, Matteo Ciccati, Chris Dore, Nir Levy, Dennis Hoffman, Jason Hussa, Kieran Gillen, John. Jonathan Kent Uratam, Henry Johnson, Django Boren, James Tynan IV, Chris Langford, Jason Wood, Tom Peachy, Ben Damstead, Rom V, Nick Walker, Patrick Coyle, Isaac Oren, Scott Carpenter, Red Narb Studios Comics, Capes and Tights Podcast, Claus Van Deven, Brian, Submit Industries, Jack Mulqueen, Kyle, Carl Kershaw, Robert Masella, Elza Chartier, Luke Nakashoji, Dr. Luke, Scott Hazelwood, Canadian by Proxy, Bradley Raider, Carl Troy, Brandon DePillis, Patrick Brower, Declan Shelby, Dan Garino, Adam Freeman, Ben Wild, Brian Clan Q, Nick Bennett, Birdcage Comics Cafe, Susanna Polo, Reed Hinkley Barnes, Mario Tiambang, Andrew Carita, Matt Mahoney, Stefan Hole, Phil Myra, Chris Machalo, Torin Grunbeck, Buzz Bubbles, Christopher Todd, Transmitter Down, Waltz Comics and Books, Akil Wilson, Alex Dimitriopoulos, Terry Dodson, Wesley Giff, Sean Kirkham, Julio Anta, Brett A. Schmidt, Jason Goodmanson, Paul Reinwan, Vita Ayala, Akil, Philip Seavey, Al Ewing, Ryan Alcock, David Kelly, Nick Polito, Brett Matthew Groom, Jason Nassi, Adam Bogert, Matthew Taylor, Nick Patera, Jacob Sorelli, Ford Gilmore, David Baraldi, Nick Hall, Bjorn Basin, John Hendricks, Steve Anderson, Ian Maxfield, Cliff Chang, Call McMahon, Scott McGovern, Nathan Fairburn, Adam Highfield, Fiona Staples, Mark Abnett, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim Demonakos, Norbert, Nick Lowe, James Kaplan, and Mission Comics and Art in San Francisco. You guys are all the best. A quick thanks to Wolfpack for letting me use their song, Outros, the show's opening theme, and to Upright T-Rex Music, who wrote, performed, off panels, outro, and ad music just for the show. Check out their music on Spotify because it's completely delightful. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week for another episode. <laughs>